Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to today's presentation on e-commerce at scale. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Patrick Ward, and uh, as was mentioned by Nikita, I was the previously the director of marketing. I am now the VP of marketing at Rootstrap, which is a custom software web development agency. And we very simply help companies scale people, processes, and products through outcome-driven development. We've obviously had number of very successful clients, but today what I want to do is walk through one of those clients as a case study of how you can choose the right development partner, how you can identify potential issues that might prevent your e-commerce company from scaling, and also what's on the horizon. We're going to have a little look at some of the emerging technology that exists within the space. So first of all, I want to introduce you to Ownable. This was our most prolific e-commerce client and the one that we're going to be using today as a case study for how to scale effectively. So what is Ownable? For context, Ownable is a rent-to-own platform. It simply allows people to rent tech devices such as Apple AirPods, MacBooks, you name it for a low weekly price, either owning them after six months of paying for them or returning them at any time. Obviously, a very interesting e-commerce model when we consider the surge in growth for rental markets. We see these with a number of things like furniture or apparel, uh, and obviously Ownable's play was towards tech devices, that way of reducing the friction that a consumer might have towards purchase, particularly for, for large ticket items. Certainly things like a MacBook, which might cost several thousands of dollars. So the case study we go through is how we forexed Ownable's revenue, ultimately delivering $2.5 million on a single Black Friday. And as much as that is obviously a signature achievement for any e-commerce company, any e-commerce company looks at Black Friday as a very important date on the calendar. But what we wanted to look at is how we got to that point. So a little uh, overview of what we're going to cover. We're going to cover the product development, specifically how we went about streamlining their flow of become a member, uh, because obviously being a rental uh, rather than an ownership-based platform, there was obviously some key components in terms of verifying income, um, making sure uh, a person had a legitimate identity. We're going to show how we rebuilt the website from scratch. Um, now, this, it, again, is something to be thinking about. Not only when you build an e-commerce platform for today, is it going to meet your needs in one year from now? But is it going to meet your needs in two years from now, five years from now? Is it going to be a scalable platform? We'll have a talk about what that looks like. And we'll also talk about how we redesigned a website to highlight particular offerings, uh, making sure that certain high ticket items that were a priority to customers were front and center, and therefore the ease of purchase uh, was facilitated. So. What were the objectives that Ownable had when they came to us? As I'm sure many of you can appreciate, many in the e-commerce space is a, a purchase to own model. You, know, you buy a product, it gets delivered to you, you now own that. Obviously with Ownable, it was a unique service because it's a rental model. So people are trying before they buy, but they only will keep those devices as long as they need that. So it's a big shift in how people purchase, particularly these high ticket items that have traditionally been associated with saving up a certain amount of money, maybe getting your employer to pay for them. The key thing here for Ownable, they'd hired a remote team before and it had destroyed that potential. There was a certain Black Friday that they had uh, before they'd engaged with our services uh, and the website they had built crashed within the first couple of hours. As you can imagine, this cost them many hundreds of thousands, even potentially millions of dollars on the biggest day of the year for them. So how do we go about it? 
obviously here we need to think about the product first. Right? The product is the core element of any e-commerce platform and how scalable it is, how user-friendly it is, is going to be critical to the success of your e-commerce business. So before the become a member flow was displayed very prominently on the site, but there was very little context. Obviously, when you're coming to Ownable site, you're coming because you want to buy a particular item. Maybe you're attracted to the latest AirPods. Maybe you want a new iPhone. Maybe you want a new MacBook. Afterwards, we made sure that it was contextually embedded within the checkout process rather than having it up front, because most times people were coming to the become a member not understanding what it was and therefore having a high bounce rate. The point here is that you entice the customer first with the product, i.e. the AirPods, the MacBook, these items that they really want, and then you show why the become a member flow was important. Because obviously, as I mentioned before, the ownable rental model meant that it still had to collect this information. It still had to ascertain what was your monthly income, what was the source of that income, uh, how stable you were, what your household net worth was, uh, maybe even getting information such as credit score, all these different financial touch points to verify that someone was going to be a good customer for paying on time, making sure that they were going to be able to meet those repayment obligations rather than are they going to just take the item and therefore fail on those liabilities. So this was really important to communicate upfront, making sure that they understood, hey, we are only asking this information because it is necessary in order to deliver the product that you really want which is ultimately the tech device you were purchasing from Ownable. So the real outcome here is obviously it increased conversion and it emphasized the value of the product to the customer. Obviously, as I said before, the challenges are that it was a very large information request. You're requiring identity verification, income verification, credit checks. The point here was that when we first participated with Ownable, we did a large uh, UX discovery. And what we found was they were actually over asking. Everyone knows the rule that if you ask a customer too many steps, you're creating more friction points. Those friction points every single time are increasing your chance of having an abandoned cart of having your customer bounce off your website and not make a purchase because there's too much cognitive overload. So what we did was simplify it down to the steps that were absolutely necessary for a user to complete, making sure that if we already had certain information on them, we could simply use that and pre-fill it in for them as opposed to putting the burden back on the customer. You never want to put too much burden on the customer, particularly in an e-commerce purchase decision where their decision to buy or not to buy directly impacts your revenue. We also added storytelling elements to explain why this process was necessary so that everyone understands what their time commitment is upfront. They understand why they have to go through the process why they have to go through this verification of both their income and their identity. But more importantly, they understand how much of a commitment it was going to be for them. This is critical because humans implicitly find it easier to handle a certain time weight as opposed to an uncertain time weight. What I mean by that is we all know the phenomenon of when you're waiting in line and you're told an estimated wait time, it makes it much easier to wait that amount of time than if you're told, wait in this line and you don't know how long it's going to be. We wanted to apply that same psychological principle into this become a member flow. Rebuilding the website from scratch. Now, many of you may have uh, e-commerce platforms that are built on some of the big guys, Shopify, Magento, all very common. 
But sometimes you might want to look at whether that is scalable for what you need in the future. The benefits of those pre-built platforms is that they can be really good for getting you off the ground. But at some point, you might run into an issue of scale. And this is where we come into a concept known as technical debt. Technical debt is very simply a case where it requires a certain amount of development effort to fix pre-existing problems that happen within your platform due to its scaling. And as you can imagine, the more technical debt you accumulate, the more development time you incur, and ultimately the more cost. So it's really important to be thinking of how scalable is my system, not just for my needs today, not just for my needs next quarter, but is it scalable for the future? So before, when we encountered the previous ownable site that was very poorly designed, it was unstable, it was unresponsive. Ultimately, this was the version we first saw that crashed on that Black Friday. So needless to say, the code base was, was not very sophisticated. And this was a really key point. Load times exceeded 30 seconds. Industry conversion of the 2.4 seconds has a 1.9% conversion rate in terms of all the way through the process to purchase. As soon as you go over five seconds, it drops to 0.6%. This might not sound like much of a drop, 1.9 to 0.6 or 1.3% difference. But as you can imagine, over the course of many, many website visitors, many, many potential customers, this can cost hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars of revenue. Because we know today that the consumer is not patient. If your website doesn't load, they're not going to give you the benefit of the doubt. They're just going to assume something's broken and they're going to find an alternative. And in the age of e-commerce that we are now, there's plenty of alternatives for them. So what did we do? First of all, we did a post-mortem and discovered there were hidden bombs in the code base and some key architectural challenges. The way that this had been set up previously by the previous vendor had been just to get it out on time. And that's a thing you always want to be careful of when you're choosing your development team, because your development team is obviously going to want to hit a milestone that you put in front of them. You know, you are obviously paying them a certain amount of money, and so they are going to want to deliver. But the key is to also allow them to push back, allow them to tell you what is technically feasible and what is not. Because if you push them too much to deliver in a certain time frame, you may end up with a situation like Ownable, a situation where the code has been slapped together in a really shoddy manner and a manner in which it is not beneficial to your business. It is very risky for those days of high traffic, such as a Black Friday, where a lot of your business model is on the line, and ultimately not building a scalable, successful website or product for the future. So what did we do? Obviously, after that Black Friday disaster where they crashed one to two hours in, Ownable was really scared. They were really scared even when hiring us in the first instance because obviously they'd worked with the development team before and they'd been burned by it. Our key was communication, making sure that they understood every step of the process and understanding how we were going to move them to this new platform. We did that to their entirely new website three weeks before Black Friday to test with larger and larger bodies of users. We ran sim simulated tests of 20,000 users to test its capacity because this is something that you might not always realize with your website. Your website might work perfectly well with 1,000 visitors. It might work really well with 10,000 visitors. But how good is it with 100,000 visitors, with a million visitors? These sort of spikes in traffic we all know are very common within e-commerce. They can happen on days like Black Friday, Cyber Monday, during the holiday season. All these particular times, maybe you run a sales promotion. It could even be incurred by that. And so it's really important that your platform has been tested 
rigorously for the different amounts of visitors that you might encounter. Because it's not good enough to just work sufficiently in low volume periods. It needs to be able to perform in high volume periods because ultimately those are the periods where you, you stand to make the most money and therefore where your user experience of your website is that much more critical to the success of how each individual customer comes to your website and then ultimately makes a purchasing decision, which leads to revenue for your business. And finally, we go here to how we redesign the website to highlight certain offerings. Before, the design was very confusing and it was focused on the company itself. It was focused too much on ownable as a concept. Now, this was not uh, a misnomer from them. Ownable knew they were new to a space. They understood that most people purchase tech devices outright. And so the fact that they were coming to a model where it was rent to own, that was a complete game changer for the industry. The problem was they'd gotten too egotistical. They'd focused it too much on themselves and how they were different rather than ultimately leading with the products. Because at the end of the day, as much as their model was innovative and new and interesting for the industry, the customer didn't particularly care about that. All the customer wanted, and indeed what the customer saw, was a way for them to acquire many tech devices at a lower cost than they previously thought accessible to them. And more importantly, that was what they were coming to the site for. So rather than focusing on the company itself, we've shifted towards those desired items. Because at the end of the day, with any e-commerce purchase, you are leading with the products first. So the products is what the customer wants. The products is why the customer is coming to your site. The rest of what your brand represents, your story, you can still have that, but that should be secondary to the primary goal, which is delivering the products that your customers want in the time frame that they want them. So what did this look like? We remodeled it rather than being focused on ownable as a concept towards the products available and how the rental process worked because that was the key for a customer to understand. They knew they wanted the product. These are products that are very common, Apple Watches, iPads, you know, PlayStations, as you can see on the screen here. But more importantly, they needed a quick summary of what the new part was. As you can see, we go from the getting account, you get your items, very simple process. Now, you and I both know, as soon as the person or a consumer picks one of these products, they are going to go through the steps we talked about previously. They're going to have to go through income verification. They're going to have to go through identity verification. But needless to say, leading with these types of products first gets a customer excited. And from that, that ultimately leads to higher conversions and ultimately makes sure that we are delivering what they want rather than what we want, i.e. telling them about the full extent of the process, what Ownable is, that was not necessary. You just needed to get a customer excited about what they're about to purchase. So needless to say, the key here was being flexible and accessible. We wanted to make sure that more features could be added down the line as Ownable expands. This is a key point that a lot of people don't think about when they're building websites, is a lot of people think of websites in the same way as building a house. They think, okay, built the house, it's done, and I don't need to worry about it all. The key with a digital asset, such as a website, is it is constantly changing. There is constant improvements. There's always going to be new additions. And so you can never think that I've built it, it's static, and I don't need to worry about it anymore. You need to constantly think and challenge your development team. Is this scalable? Can we add more features easily. How challenging is it to make new sections of this website? What if we had to change the entire thing? How easy is that? 
asking all of those questions and making sure that you understand the time commitments of each of those decisions is really critical because as I'm sure everyone can appreciate, e-commerce is a really tough industry to be in. There's a lot of shifts, there's a lot of changes on a constant basis. And if you're not able to iterate and improve your core product in a moment's notice, then that can spell disaster for you and your business and your competitors can swoop in and take those customers. Needless to say, as a result of redesigning this towards the customer's needs as opposed to the company's needs, uh, the conversion rate increased from 1% to 5%. Again, sounds small, but when you multiply this over many thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of website visitors, it really adds up, and it adds up to significant revenue over the course of many, many months. Of course, we were very happy with this as a company. Uh, in that particular Black Friday that I mentioned, the website went off without a hitch, handled every one of the excess users with ease, and they received four times the amount of revenue, accumulating in $2.5 million in sales. But the thing that I'm most proud of is that the site handled that increased user load because I think this is the key takeaway for anyone in the e-commerce space. It's not just about can you gain revenue from your website, but can you gain revenue in a frictionless manner? Because at the end of the day, you make sure that your customer doesn't have to apply too many decisions to their process. Because every time a customer makes a certain decision, that's one more case where they could decide not to choose, decide to go to a competitor, decide it's too challenging. We know this, that humans are in an increasing state of cognitive overload. They receive thousands of advertising messages a day. They're receiving cr uh, scope creep from their jobs in that now with mobile phones, they're now more accessible to their jobs. There's more content to consume. All of these things have not had a negligible impact. Quite the contrary, they've had a very profound impact on today's consumer. And with so many decisions to make, if we can simplify, if we can pull it back to as few steps as possible in as easy to understand way as possible, then ultimately we're going to get higher conversions, we're gonna get more revenue, and ultimately, we're going to deliver what the customers want in the time that they want it. You know, we all know the biggest fish in the e-commerce world of Amazon. And of course, with their two-day shipping, it's meant that consumers have constantly expected that when they purchase things, they want them now, and they want to make sure that the process is as easy for them to do in as few clicks as possible. I draw this uh, up here as a nice little quote that we're able to deploy continuously without taking anything down. This was a real problem for Ownable in the past. They used to have to take down their website to make any changes. It seems like a simple fundamental, but for them it was a massive game changer because suddenly they were able to operate iterative tests, they were able to run A-B experiments on their website. And more importantly, they're not losing any money while they run these experiments. More importantly than that is that the customers are not getting frustrated. That's a key point. As soon as a customer gets frustrated, they're that much more likely to leave your website and ultimately not purchase from you. So moving away from Ownable as a nice little case study, wanted to touch on some of the emerging tech in e-commerce because I think this is an important area that a lot of people are always keeping their eye out. What is the media hype behind these and how much do I legitimately have to care about them? We're going to look at three of them most notably, AI, AR, and voice. So first of all, artificial intelligence. So obviously, one of the biggest 
applications of artificial intelligence is associated with fraud. Fraud is a huge costly endeavor for many e-commerce, mainly resulting around chargebacks, inventory lost. It's always tempting to try and put more and more protection in place so that you, your website is not a victim of e-commerce fraud. But we also need to think of the flip side and what we've already talked about. If we put too many protections in place, we are creating those friction moments. Those friction moments are likely driving our customers towards a point of frustration. And as we've talked about before, frustration leads to unhappy customers who are unlikely to purchase and have an increased likelihood to go away from your website towards one of your competitors that is going to make it easier for them to facilitate their desire to get a particular product and buy it in as quick a time frame as possible. This is where artificial intelligence comes in and where it is super beneficial. So what we look at when we think of artificial intelligence, not only are we thinking of the fraud side of things, of being able to protect ourselves from excessive chargebacks and therefore losing that inventory, we also look at recommendation engines because as much as artificial intelligence can protect us from the back end, it can also serve us into making sure that our customers get the products they want and indeed upsell those customers to other products they might want purely with recommendation engines. So a few definitions here. There are a few types of recommendation engines that people can be implementing with the help of a team. And there are many out of the box solutions that are starting to emerge specifically for the e-commerce space here. The first one is collaborative filtering. Now, collaborative filtering works on basing decisions on either the user or the item they purchase. So we go user, user is that people like you like a certain product. And item to item is if you like this product, you might also like this other product and the user item combines the two. As you can imagine, all three of those subsets of collaborative filtering need a lot of data to begin with. And if you're just starting, or even if you are a relatively small e-commerce sh shop, you may not have sufficient data to get statistically significant uh, information to your recommendation engine that allows these types of rec recommended products to be surfaced for your customers. But then we also look at content filtering. And this is based on a description of the item and a profile of the user's preferences. This is really useful when you have information on the item, but unknown on the user. As I'm sure is obvious, this is often the case for many e-commerce shops because you have a very extensive knowledge of your products, what you're selling, the nature of those products. But more often than not, your user is coming to you as an unknown. Now, yes, we can talk about there are ways to make a user sign in, perhaps if they're a repeat customer and we're trying to create that repeat model, certainly we can start building in some of these preferences over time. But when that user initially comes to you, you're likely not going to know anything about them. So content filtering is a great way to match that unknown of the user with the known that is the information about the product itself. Of course, we have applied this. We implemented this in Ownable in the latter stages of 2020. Again, I'm sure we're all familiar with them. AI just continues to make these recommendation engines smarter and surfacing the products that people have a much higher propensity to buy. Augmented reality. This is one of the most interesting, uh, exciting developments that I think is going to change e-commerce in a big way. We've already seen the concept of e-commerce tackling brick and mortar, but what augmented reality does is brings back into the fold an element of the retail experience. We call this the showroom buy buying experience. 
This is where through uh, a filter on your phone, most notably Snapchat, uh, Snap tends to be the, the forerunner here, where you can look at an item, instantly order it to your phone. So imagine, if you will, something like going through an Ikea. Rather than having to pick out the product itself, you could hold up your phone to it, identify all the different specifications of the product, and order it one click and have it delivered to your door by the time you got home. This is really critical because at the moment, there is a lot of emphasis on certain retailers and certain distribution. But with augmented reality, you are starting to direct traffic to your specific owned properties. And that's going to be critical as we go into the future of how can you create ecosystems that are just delivered by your company and your brand rather than have to rely on third parties, whether that's third party retailers or third party e-commerce stores. And voice search. Obviously, at the moment, when you ask someone like an Alexa or uh, a Google Home, the focus is on buying the product instantly. Uh, you know, hey Alexa, purchase me uh, another, uh, you know, dishwashing fluid, for example. That is obviously based on looking through your Amazon orders, finding those items, and then from there, it is just matching that up, making the purchase. This is all well and good if you know the item you're looking for. But what if you don't? What if you're trying to figure out a certain uh, item to buy for a Christmas gift? This is where voice search is heading towards, and it's a really exciting world that is getting, honestly, a lot of people in traditional SEO quite scared. The benefit of voice search is that you're able to ask many questions to figure out certain product specifications and not only figure out those questions together with a voice assistant, more importantly, you're putting less pressure on call center resources, which is obviously a good thing in terms of cost. And it's also able to showcase it in a subtle way rather than having your user run around various different websites, various different guides, various different product reviews, trying to ascertain the information. As we talked about before, the consumer is very heavily saturated with their cognitive overload these days. So anything we can do to reduce that is obviously beneficial. Voice search really plays into this. So when we look here, uh, this was an experiment that uh, an agency of mine uh, had done with Kmart, where uh, a Kmart division in my home country of Australia, not the American one, which as we all know, went, went bankrupt, uh, to provide product availability, answer the common questions, and locations of nearest stores for pickup. Now, obviously, this tool could also link into a standard e-commerce delivery, but the point is, is that it helps you find the things you're looking for, it gives you information, and it does it in a very seamless, frictionless way. A few uh, questions back and forth, and you're very quickly able to find the answer to what you're looking for, and more importantly, the product you're looking for. Now, when we flip this over to the e-commerce side, in terms of what you as a, as a retailer can think about, this is very powerful because suddenly you are not at the behest of different platforms such as an Amazon or a Best Buy. You are able to be thinking of, can I create a voice assistant that people can talk to that allows them to create an ecosystem in which I am focused purely on delivering products from my inventory, from my e-commerce store to my customers. So in summary, 
What does all of this mean? When we boil it down, it really comes down to three things. Whenever you're developing an e-commerce platform, you always need to understand the tech implications. I myself am a non-technical person, and many of you may also be non-technical, but we always need to lean heavily on experienced technical people and ask them the right questions and understand the implications of those because it's not just enough to build a website that works today. We need to make sure that website works now, tomorrow, next quarter, and into the future. We need to create those frictionless customer experiences. We need to make sure that the customer is not overly burdened by any decision that we put on the technical side for our e-commerce products and our e-commerce websites. Because as we know, friction creates those decision points in which a customer decides, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to purchase. And that's hurting us directly. That's lost revenue and obviously increased cost because we spent money, presumably, to acquire that customer. We want to make sure that that yields fruit for us at the end. And then finally, keeping an eye out for the emerging tech early. We know this as a result of things like the pandemic, that at any moment, some disruption can happen. That disruption may be good, it may be bad. But if you can always be on the lookout for what applications of new disruption can benefit your business, or even if they do pose a risk to your business, how you can mitigate it early, you're always going to be in a much better position for the future. Feel free to connect me with me on LinkedIn or email me at patrick.ward at rootstrap.com. Happy to answer any follow-up questions. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, Patrick, for your speech. Uh, we have about uh, four minutes and three questions, so it will be some, some kind of blitz, I think. <laughs> So the first question is, uh, what is your recommendation? Offer a product using search data and similar products on site or integrate social digital track of a user, kids, dogs, geo, age? Yes, yeah, so what we have found that search data and similar products tends to be, uh, tends to go inaccurate for a couple of reasons. And the main reason is, is it's the phenomenon that many of you might have experienced when you, for example, purchase uh, a flight and then suddenly you get three ads after the fact for airlines. Um, the, the problem with using search data is it's often reactive. And so by being reactive, it actually implicitly happens after the customer has already made a purchase decision. So it's better to in integrate social attributes um, of the user. Again, there are, you know, we all know there's, there's a lot of privacy considerations. This is why first party data rather than third party data continues to, um, to play a big role. But the more information you can have on your user, the better, because the more you know about them, the more you can start making predictions um, and this is really where AI comes into its own, where you can start making predictions on large masses of consumer groups based on, okay, if all these consumers who have these attributes make this purchase decision, then I can surface that particular product to another consumer who hasn't, uh, who has just come to my site. Um, that's where you start really getting into very sophisticated, um, levels of predicting where the revenue will come um, rather than trying to be too reactive on based on a previous purchase behavior uh, thank you uh and next question what do you think is more important for e-commerce business with a small budget attractive design or good functionality a hundred percent good functionality um, you can spend on design later if you've got um, some, some initial money in the door. The fact of the matter is it just comes down to 
as less clicks as possible, getting the customer straight to the product that they want to buy uh, in as efficient way as possible. I mean, look at Amazon. Even Amazon to this day has one of the ugliest user oh, yeah. interfaces in the world, <laughs> and they're still a very successful company. It speaks exactly to that. Don't don't overcomplicate what your industry is, which is if you've done all the work of bringing someone to your website, you've honestly done eight tenths of it because you've convinced them that this is the product they need, this is the product they want to buy, and therefore, once they're on your site, you just need to get them as quickly as possible into that checkout, grab that credit card, and fulfill that order. Yeah, this, uh, this is a great answer. Uh, so the last question in about uh, one minute. Uh, how does Apple change uh, change in tracking personal data, user allows or forbids, influence online states, adds effectiveness, especially when we speak about iPhone's owners? Yeah, so this is obviously a really interesting point where the the majority of iPhones in terms of uh, the dynamic is that most are in the United States. When we look at the rest of the world, uh, Android dominates. Um, but obviously, as many of you can appreciate, the American consumer is still the most in demand. It has the most, uh, the highest propensity to purchase. It has the highest purchasing power. What we've already found, and this is even in the the the, the months up post uh, Apple's changes, is it hasn't made an impact on the digital advertising. Um, all that's happened is that the way that you reach those customers has slightly shifted. So rather than being able to use uh, Apple itself um, and understanding uh, exactly what your specific user that you're targeting, what's happened now is we've moved into what we would call user clusters. And so it just means that you're not able to pinpoint that exact person, but you're still able to pinpoint large groups of people. And honestly, as I see it for the e-commerce space, this shouldn't be too concerning. It still means that spending on digital advertising, particularly in the e-commerce space, still works. Um, it's funny, in the three months post this change, we've seen an uptick in digital advertising um, on Apple. And I think that's a reflection of you still need to access customers, even if you can't um, necessarily understand everything about them, you can still get a number of leading indicators. And so with those leading indicators, it just puts the onus on you to figure out, do you really understand your customers? Do you really understand how they buy? Do you understand similar people personas to those customers of who else would like to buy. And ultimately, it then comes back to first party data. So this comes back to what I was talking about. Of the more you can create ecosystems where people will spend time with your e-commerce platform or your e-commerce company rather than through a medium, the better. Because at the end of the day, customers will give up their data. They will give up many forms of, you know, user information preferences directly in a first party context as long as they're receiving value for that transaction and i think that's the burden here rather than what third party data was which was essentially trying to leverage other people's or other brands trust in uh in that uh, consumer company relationship it's more imperative on each of us to understand our customers, make sure we're delivering what they want, and they'll happily give us all sorts of information about themselves. Thank you so much, Patrick, for your speech. Thank you for this useful information. I see that we have other questions, but we have no time, guys. Sorry, but you can answer Patrick uh, in his social media and uh, via his email. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Nikita. Hope uh, we will see you on our other events. Uh, and thank you one more time and have a nice day. Thank you very much. Bye.